So, for about 30 years now, I have been talking, writing, teaching, and lecturing, and yes, even nagging about information literacy. Now, when I started a few decades ago, information literacy was a somewhat quaint notion that my job was to help college students seek out information, evaluate it, and see if it met their needs. Um, oh, and that uh, school sucks, using a website like schoolsucks.com to lift a paper and pass it in as your own is a really, really bad idea. Now, um, a little while ago, my son Lucas said that my career could be summed up in one sentence. Information literacy saves lives. Maybe a little overstated, but it became a running family joke. Although, with regard to the aforementioned schoolsucks.com, information literacy can also save grades and a little bit of embarrassment. But it's become alarming that now information literacy has become an existential skill in a public health crisis. Um, it's not so much information literacy anymore, but it's what the Germans would call information competence. Are you competent enough to know that your mind is being hacked to be influenced to act in ways that are not in your best interests? For the past five years, our brains have been bathed in a constant stream of stress hormones, whether it be from the pandemic, war, riots, uh, lockdowns, um, and we're understandably freaked out, and also angry and outraged. And the problem is, is that the theme of this TED Talk this year is that it's supposed to be restarting the conversation. And the one thing I know absolutely without question is that you cannot have a conversation with an angry and outraged person. How do I know this? Well, I used to be a bartender at Joe's Nighthawk Bar and Grill and a public librarian. And I know that you cannot have a conversation with a person who is angry and outraged, whether it's about an overdue fee on a, a late book, or whether I'm gonna let you into the public library during a pandemic, or the price of burritos. Now, some of what fuels this is what's called the algorithms of outrage. The algorithms of outrage is a construct that's been talked about for the past couple of years by scholars from places like the University of Kentucky and Michigan State and, and among others. It goes something like this. The influencers and the media want to put things in front of you that interest you. And believe me, they know what interests you. But they want you to look more. And what they discovered is that if they put things in front of you that will scare you, make you angry, and outrage you, the more you're going to look. Why do they want you to look? Well, the more you look, the more they can sell you something or they get the money that comes from when you click and you put your eyeballs on, on their content. So, why do we look? We're evolutionarily hardwired to do so. Our ancestors, or at least the successful ones, when they were going about their business, developed the skill that if something was out of place, something was not right, like, for instance, that bush over there, it's rustling, and there's no wind. Adrenaline kicks in, the fight or flight response is engaged, our senses become a little bit more sharper, and then we either run away from the bush, or we took our spear and we stuck it in the bush to see if we could kill the tiger that's hiding in there. Unfortunately for our ancestors who were less successful, they would be going about their business of the day, walk by the bush that wasn't rustling. Nothing's out of the ordinary. They're not paying any attention to it. They're on autopilot. Unfortunately for them, the successful tiger ancestor who learned to be in the bush and not make it and not rustle would then have the unfortunate ancestor for supper. 
So why is this a problem? Well, it's the aforementioned um, stress hormones that I was talking about. Now, I've already talked about adrenaline, but adrenaline is fairly fast acting and dissipates relatively quickly. There's another stress hormone called cortisol. Cortisol lasts a while. Think about the last time you saw something on the news or on the internet or something that your buddy just told you that really made you angry. If you were thinking about it three hours later and it was still making you angry, that's your good friend cortisol. Now, the other problem with it is that elevated levels of cortisol, according to doctors from the Mayo Clinic, can result in suppressed um, immune system, decreased libido, acne, elevated levels of blood and blood pressure and um, blood sugar, and obesity. Anybody gain weight during the pandemic? So, when I was a librarian here at Woodford College, I had a colleague that taught in the broadcast journalism department. And she would always tell her students, if it bleeds, it leads. Now, what she meant by that was is that the more lurid and the more outrageous the story was, the more likely it was to be the first thing you saw on the local news broadcast, the headline on the newspaper, or the first thing you saw on your TikTok, Instagram, or Twitter feed. Now, this is not a new thing. Let me tell you the story about a man named William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst was a newspaper publisher in New York City who operated around the turn of the 20th century. He turned his newspaper into a propaganda machine. Historically, this was called yellow journalism because Hearst publications would be printed on yellow paper because it was the cheapest thing at the time. Now, he took an outrageous event. A United States battleship, the USS Maine, blew up in the Havana, Cuba harbor for unknown reasons, killing almost everybody on board. Now, Hearst insinuated that the main blowing up was the fault of the Cubans or the Spaniards because Cuba was a Spanish colony at the time. This resulted in uh, he got and the American president got the war they wanted, which became the Spanish-American War. Um, along the way, he insinuated uh, that these people were their f that it was these people's fault and created an enemy. And that's kind of what the algorithms of outrage do, and that comes forward to this time as well, is that the influencers have realized that if I want to outrage you, if I want you to pay attention, it's really great to have an enemy, especially if they're sinister. So, back, um, and so, um, uh, one of the things that happens with the algorithms of outrage is it divides society. It creates an us versus them. Vaccine versus non-vaccinated. Uh, uh, fair elections versus stolen elections. But the thing is, is that if we want to restart the conversation, we have to set the outrage aside. Because again, no conversation is ever based on owning the libs or you're destroying democracy. Around the turn of the century, um, we entered into what became known as the age of information. That's matured five years later, if that's the right word or the right phrase, into the age of anxiety. Again, we're freaked out, we're angry, and we have to set it aside again if we're going to restart the conversation. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not saying don't pay attention to the news. There are things that are worth paying attention to. We just have to decide if it's worth the daily stress hormone bath or not. We need to use our information literacy skills to become critical thinkers. Uh, so we can make sure that this is the hill that we want to die on, metaphorically. So here's your homework. If you can, there's a four-part series uh, that um, appeared on public television in the fall of 2020, and if you can find it, you should. It's called Hacking Your Mind. 
I've only got about 10 minutes to kind of explain these ideas to you and introduce them to you. Over the course of the four hours of this series, it will go into it in much more detail. Then, uh, I'd like you to uh, find a news media site of whatever political persuasion you want. And just taking a look at the headlines without looking at the stories. Count how many headlines are talking about a catastrophe that's happened, a catastrophe that's happening now, or a catastrophe that's going to happen in the near or far future. And then compare that to the amount of headlines that either have good news or at least neutral news, and pay attention to the ratio. And then, for the next couple of weeks, sit with the idea that everything that you click, watch, and read was probably designed to upset, anger, and, outra and um, outrage you, which will then lead you to click, watch, and read more stuff that will anger, scare, and outrage you. And this, my friends, is the anxiety bubble. And the thing about an anxiety bubble is that it is really, really hard to recognize it when you're in it. So take your anxiety bubble and set it aside and name it. Makes it much easier to deal with. Or so my therapist tells me. And then, and only then, center yourself. And then restart the conversation with people who you may not agree with socially or, uh, or politically. Because again, this is the one thing I do know. You cannot have a conversation with somebody who is angry and outraged. And not to be too superior about it, I can't start a conversation when I am angry and outraged and expect a good result. So, Use your critical link thinking skills, your information literacy skills, and be competent, and save your life. Thank you.